Hi, I hope you're doing great. In this video, I want to talk about a really cool feature in the collections module in Python, namely counter. So first of all, I just want to show you a very typical case where the counter module is really useful. And afterwards, we'll look at a few more features of the counter module. Finally, at the end of the video, I'll give you an example where I combine the counter class with the pathlib module. This is really so that you can see the counter module in action and interacting with other Python features. So first of all, we go into the collections module and we simply import counter. Let's formulate a very typical problem. The problem is regarding aggregation. Say as an example that you have taken in votes regarding what is the best TV series. So you have some TV series object here. Let's call it TV series votes. And inside here we have votes for the best TV series. So maybe we have something like The Wire and then maybe have something like Breaking Bad and maybe you have something like The Mandalorian. This is nice, but you typically have more than one vote for each TV series. Otherwise you can't really determine which one is best. Let me just put this on a separate line and say you have three more. So maybe you again have The Wire and then you have The Wire a third time and then you have Breaking Bad again. Of course, this is very simplified, but let's say that these are the votes. How can we aggregate this? How can we get this on a form where we have like The Wire, three votes, Breaking Bad, two votes, Mandalorian, one vote. So I'll show you two ways of doing this without using the counter class. You will see that both of them are quite cumbersome and boring to write out. The first is the very manual way. It is simply that we make some kind of voting summary as an empty dictionary. And then we simply go through this list and aggregate. So we take each item in this TV series votes, and then we take our voting summary at the point of our item and aggregate it. This seems like it would work, but it would not because when you start here with the wire, you'll try to access voting summary of the wire, but that doesn't really exist. So you need some annoying things like, yeah, so if the item is not in voting summary and part of the keys, then you need to add it. Let me set it to zero and then you aggregate by one. This works fine, so let's actually just see this. So now we can take our voting summary and just print the whole thing out. And here we can see the output. So it works perfectly, that's not a problem. You can really see that it took us five lines just doing this and it's a bit cumbersome. You'll easily get into key errors if you're not careful. So there should be better ways. And even without using counter, you can do this slightly more efficient. You can use the get method, which is a fun thing that I just wanted to show anyway. Just close this down. So say we want to do exactly the same thing. We can have our voting summary. That's fine, initiate this. We need to do the looping, so I'll just copy it. So instead of doing the if sentence nonsense, what you can do is to go into your voting summary and then take your item. And then you can use the following trick. You go into your voting summary, you use the get method, and here you pass in item zero and then plus one. So to see what's going on here, the right side is executed first. You try to go into the voting summary and get the value for the key item. The thing is with the get method, if it doesn't exist, then it'll just retrieve zero by default. So in any case, this sets the voting summary item either to zero plus one, which is one, or if it exists, it accrements it by one. So you can now see that if you also print out this. Since I'm doing a lot of print statements, let me just call this very manual and this thing here, I will call get method. Two ways of doing things gives the exact same thing. Even here, when we're being clever, this is an annoying amount of code for something so simple. So now the counter class comes to the rescue. Now it's incredibly simple. We make our voting summary again, but now we just take our counter class and simply pass in TV series votes. And that's everything. Now let's just print this out and call this with counter. You can see here that you get this kind of counter object, it's not a basic dictionary, but it has the same information. And the fact that it's inside this counter object will just make things more convenient. So here we have five lines of code, three lines of code being very clever, and one line of code here, just knowing that a counter class exists. 
course, the voting system here is a bit contrived, but this goes for everything where you need to aggregate data. So the first advantage of using the counter class is that it saves you writing this boring code, saves you running into key errors and all this kind of stuff. The second advantage is that it, now you get a lot of useful methods for aggregates. I'll show you three of them. So you have useful method one. So this is the method called update. So now you have your counter here. Often in real time systems, you'll get more data in, so you want to update it. This is now incredibly simple. You just take your voting summary and use the update method. So this is a method on the counter class. And by using the update method, you can just pass in the new votes. So say you get one more vote for breaking bad. You got one more vote for Mandalorian. And maybe you got a vote for something you hadn't seen previously. So maybe you have suits. Now, if you print this, let me call this updated. Now, here you can see something a bit funny. I misspelled breaking bad to breeding bad, unfortunately. And now you can see that if you misspell something, then of course it'll just make a new key. But I, I don't want to do that. So of course I'll add this as breaking bad and run the code again. Here you can see we still got this counter object, but now we have three votes for breaking bad and also a new one for suits. So the first thing that's really convenient about the counter is that you get to very nicely update your polling or your aggregate data in a very convenient, easy way. The second useful method is what's called the most common method. I'll simply just print this out for you. So you take your voting summary and then you use the most common method just like this. And you can see here now that you got a list of tuples where the most common one or the most popular one in the voting system is first and then the second most common and the third most common and so on. So they're now ordered. So this is if you pass no arguments into the most common one, pass in an argument, say like two, run the code again, then you just get the two most popular ones. So you can see how this works. If you just want the most popular one, then you pass in one. If you want the three most popular, you pass in three and so on. This is again, very convenient. So if you look back on top here, say you didn't implement a counter, you implemented basic dictionaries. You need to write more code for updating. You need to write more code for finding the most common ones. So the counter class really provides you with some nice methods. The third method is a pretty new one. This is the total method. So I'll try to print out a voting summary with total. And I think by the name, you can see what this does. Unfortunately, when I run this, you can see here that counter object has no attribute total. So what's really going on? What's really going on is that this is a completely new feature. So this came about in Python 3.10. And what I'm running here locally on my system is Python 3.9, so I don't have access to it. So rather than running it in Python 3.10, I think I can just show you this. So here we have the total method for the counter class. This also gives me a good excuse to show you how you can also initiate a counter in a different way. So here we have the counter and we pass in A is equal to 10, B is equal to five and C is equal to zero. This is just another way of initiating a counter with now keys A, B and C. And these are the counts 10, five and zero. When you use the total method, then it simply computes the total of all votes. So for the example I had in the beginning where I had lists of all the votes, this is not maybe that necessary because you could just take the length of the list. But in other cases, this might be really convenient. I just wanted to show you how you can incorporate counter with other Python concepts. So in this small example, I have a folder called CSV file here that has six CSV files, each of them representing like the age and weight of a person. So the row here is a person of age 26 and weighs 77 kilos. You can see that all of them have the same type of data, but they have varying degrees of rows. So here we have one row, here you have four rows, and here we have essentially zero rows. So given this bit of information here, what would be nice is some kind of summary function. So the summary function is supposed to compute a summary statistics for the CSV file. So essentially telling us how many of the files have zero rows, how many of them have one row, how many of them have two rows and so on and so on. So here the code is already, already pre-written, so I'll just walk it through with you. So here what you can do is after defining the function, you can use the pathlib library here to get the path to the files which I will pass in CSV files afterwards, and then use the iterdir method here, to get an iterable that we can use. Then I make an empty list indicating the number of lines in each file. And then I gradually go into each file and check how many lines there are. So for each file path here in the CSV files, I open the file in read mode, and then I grab the number of lines. So this is some wacky macky code here that really just ensures that we don't count the header, namely where it says like age and weight as one of the lines in our CSV files. And then we append the number of lines to the individual line list here. 
So far, so good. No need to use counters so far. But now you have this individual lines list that contains how many lines each file has. Then you need to aggregate. And of course you can write your own code, but that really blows the function. So now it's really convenient to just return counter of these individual lines. So here we're gonna use the function, we use it on the folder in question, and we just print it out. So this means that the number of files who had three lines are two, the number of files who had two lines are one, the number of files who had one line is one, the number of files who had four lines is one, and the number of files who had zero lines is one. So this just gives a really convenient way of summarizing how many lines are in the different files. So that's it for this video. I hope you find counter useful as I do and will consider using it in future projects. If you like our content and want to see more of it, then consider subscribing, liking the video, and I'll see you again soon. Thanks and have a nice day.